Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back. I'm Tony Hernandez. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. Today is Saturday, June 22nd. We have another incredible show, and I just want to thank all the great fans out there who are watching us on SEC television, those of us who, who, who watch on the YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you for keep coming back. I encourage you to tell this show to your friends and family. Uh, we have a great show today. I'm going to bring on a mayoral candidate, Cam Winton, and then later we have Janice Quinlan, who's a real estate agent in the area. We're going to discuss uh, the idea of buying a home, the real estate market in the Twin Cities, and, and a whole lot more. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on our first guest, Cam Winton. Thank hey. you for being on the show. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate it. Yeah, so you said uh, you were doing something uh, pretty exciting before you came here. Can you tell the audience? Uh, what you were up to? Well, sure. As I think folks know, we had uh, quite a series of storms roll through over the past two days. And a lot of folks in Minneapolis and elsewhere are out of power. And they're down trees in their front yards and streets, backyards all over the place. And so I was reading about the storm coverage. And uh, a tweet went out from a homeowner in Minneapolis. And she said, whoever can come to my house and help me get this tree off my roof will get my vote for mayor. And so I wrote her back and said, I'm on my way. And so I went on over to her house. And as it turned out, uh, that particular tree is going to take a real uh, cherry picker device and uh, some tree surgeons plus Excel Energy. There was a down power line wrapped into it. So she and I did not end up touching that tree after all. But uh, her neighbors had a situation that I could help with. And so yeah, I spent a good chunk of the afternoon helping out uh, moving moving down branches. Wow, that's pretty That's pretty amazing. And that storm last night was actually pretty powerful. I was sitting in uh, at, at my place with my wife, and we are just watching the trees swaying back and forth. Yeah. And I couldn't believe how dark it got. I think on the longest day, or one of the longest days of summer, right. all of a sudden, 7.30 PM, it's completely dark outside. And they said, right. uh, XL Energy said that uh, 276,000 customers in, in the Twin Cities area were without power. Right. And uh, still, to this day, I think a lot of these people uh, don't have power right now and they said it might not come back till Sunday or Tuesday uh, something of that yeah sort. absolutely so, uh, and if I could share with you and, and your viewers one thing that maybe I learned back when I took my driver's test but I certainly had forgotten it that if you get to a four-way stop and the lights are out at that stop uh, treat it like a four-way stop sign and let everybody take turns and so far in Minneapolis anyway people are doing a good job of that and I bet elsewhere as well yeah an another tip for uh, those of you watching is is when you're driving to and you see a water waist high in, in the highway or the street, don't drive through there because right. it'll do some pretty severe damage to your car. Just just stop. Right. You know, it might go against your instincts just to stop in the middle of the road, but don't drive through that. And uh, wow, that's pretty amazing though that uh, you, you went out and helped uh, a fellow oh. Minneapolis resident. That's great. It was good to be able to feel useful uh, given all the help that needs to be pitched in there. So yeah. Nice. Well, can, can you talk a little more about uh, your campaign? H sure. How do you think it's going so far? I think it's going really well. It's a remarkable race. It's the first open seat race for mayor of Minneapolis in 20 years. And we're using an unusual procedure called ranked choice voting, which St. Paul and Minneapolis have used previously, uh, but not in highly contested races. This will be the first time that ranked choice voting is being used in a highly contested race in one of the Twin Cities. So it's a heck of a race. Can you can you explain a little more? Because in St. Paul, we have the ranked choice voting. We had right. it for the first time, I think, in 2009 for the right. school board mayor race there. Uh, I still don't really fully understand sure. what it is, and, and I think probably many, many voters don't. So can sure. you explain what that is? And there's no shame in not getting it, because I'll tell you, before I threw my hat in the ring for this race, I certainly wasn't clear on how it works. So here's ranked choice voting in a nutshell. There's only one day of voting in the entire process, Tuesday, November 5, 2013. There's no primary. All candidates proceed directly to the general election. And in my case, that means six DFLers, and a couple of others, and I. And when a given voter walks into the voting booth, that voter could just put one name, like a regular election, or they could rank up to three names. The counting starts that night. If one candidate receives 50% or more of the first preferences expressed, that candidate wins. But in the Minneapolis mayor's race, that's not going to happen. There's simply too many candidates. And so the counters start dropping off the last place candidate in a given round of counting. And then on all the ballots that listed that now dropped candidate as first, the counters give that ballot to the second preference listed. And they factor those numbers in. 
if somebody wins 50% <clears throat> or more of those votes, then they win. Uh, but I think in this race, it's going to take quite a few rounds of counting, dropping the last place candidate and giving weight to the second and then third preferences on those ballots until somebody wins. That's interesting because uh, one or two weeks ago was the DFL convention That's to right. uh, have the endorsement. They were going to endorse they, their mayor's candidate. And uh, it turns out that after, I think, four ballots, four rounds, they, they couldn't come up with a, a clear and concise uh, winner. And That's right. the DFL chairman, uh, Ken Martin, uh, he said, I think prior to this, he said it really weakens our party if we don't have an endorsement in this mayoral race. Uh, they, in fact, did not come up with a, with a clear winner. So can you talk, does that help or hurt your campaign that, that, that the DFL could not uh, find one person to endorse? Sure. I, I'll leave it to others to judge, but I will tell you what one judgment was. Uh, the Star Tribune editorial board wrote an editorial right after last Saturday's DFL endorsing convention, and I'm paraphrasing here, but they said that the convention brought down everybody who participated in it. They went on to list each of the DFL candidates and how the results of that endorsing convention had hurt each of those DFL con uh, candidates. And then the editorial closed by saying that uh, some say the winner of the DFL endorsing convention was Cam Winton or one of my opponents. And they explained why it had looked like uh, I might be one of the two winners coming out of the convention or the people who had whose stature had been enhanced by the events of the convention. So at least according to the Star Tribune editorial board, yeah, it was a good day for me. Mm -hmm. And you're not seeking uh, any party endorsement here. You're running as, as a true independent. That's right. And uh, what, why did you come to that decision not to sure. seek uh, either the DFL or, or the other party's endorsement? Right, because I think at the municipal level of politics, we can put party aside. We can leave partisanship for other levels of government. and. Partisanship has its place in our political system, but at the municipal level of government where we need to be focusing on the basics, and that's a big thing in my race, making sure we have enough police officers on the street, making sure we pave our streets, making sure our school system is world class, those types of issues, I don't think we need to get hung up on partisanship. And so that's right, I'm not seeking the endorsement of any party in this race. And then at the end of the day, when the voters go and vote in this particular race, they're just going to see uh, names on the ballot. It's not like a legislative race or a congressional race where you actually see uh, the D or the R next you know, to people's names. It's a really fair thought, Tony, but uh, in Minneapolis, they have to do things a little bit differently. And so in fact, what they do is enable each candidate to pick three words that will appear next to his or her name. Wow. And so I'm sure that some of my opponents will pick Democratic Farmer Labor. Uh, but I'm not listing any party, mm -hmm. and uh, I won't tell you what my three words are yet. Wait till early August when I file. So you can but put any three, any words. three words you want. Tony Hernandez show me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about vote for me? <laughs> you could. Um, wow. Well, not to take us too far off topic here, but in the last mayoral election when they had the same three words thing, some guy I forget, call him Bob Smith. He picked his two words as "is awesome." So on the ballot, it said Bob Smith is awesome. So there you go. And how'd that work out for him? Uh, Bob's not the mayor. Not so awesome. Then. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, you've made, uh, you've made a lot of news with your campaign. Uh, when did you, first of all, when did you launch your campaign formally? Sure. Formally in, gosh, I guess it would have been the first week of March, approximately. And uh, before that, I was laying the groundwork. And I filed the paperwork for my campaign back in January. And okay. so I've been at this for a while now. Okay, so yeah, March, uh, you, you've been at it for a while, and I, I've read a lot about you in various publications, the Star Tribune, Pioneer Press, Southwest Journal, uh, and your campaign team has done some pretty creative uh, things in order to, to get your name out there and, and to get people talking and to create and generate a buzz over your campaign. So I yeah. congratulate you on that. And, Thanks, Tony. Uh, you've that. made some uh, pretty interesting press conferences, and I, I wanted the, you, you to just explain to people a, a couple of them that you've done so far. Sure, sure. Well, as I mentioned, one of the key things for me in this race is that the city of Minneapolis is a wonderful place to live. And my wife and I are proud to raise our two kids there, and it's home now. Uh, that said, I think too often City Hall spends time and our money on the bells and whistles rather than the basics, on the things that would be nice to have rather than the things that we need to have. And so, for example, the city currently is uh, talking a lot about building a streetcar line at the cost of $40 million per mile wow. at the same time that it does not pave our streets very effectively. And so on those related issues, I've had uh, two press conferences that were particularly fun. One, I gave standing in a pothole to draw attention to the fact that we have some really bad potholes in Minneapolis. And it's not just a result of pothole season. It's as a result of a lack of commitment to taking care of our basic infrastructure. 
So I stood there in the pothole in the middle of an intersection while the Star <laughs> Tribune and Minnesota Public Radio and some other outlets were there. And you know, I, I did get a lot of attention. And, and what was important for me is to draw attention to that issue. And I was able to engage the city on a conversation there. Uh, the second big one I did was on a moving city bus. And that city bus goes, and when I gave the press conference, was going right down the route of the proposed streetcar line. And my point, of course, was that we already have a great transit system. We can make it better, sure. Uh, but it's called the bus line. And we don't need to spend $40 million per mile to build a streetcar when there's a bus that goes over the exact same route already. Hmm. Wow. That's, uh, that, so, you, so people have been paying attention to these things that you've been I, doing. Then. I think so. I know so. Um, what I've found is that as long as I draw strong contrasts with my seven opponents, which really is not hard to do because they all believe the same thing. They're all coming from a background in government. And I'm not. I'm coming from the private sector. My colleagues and I built a business, and I'm looking to bring fresh eyes to City Hall. Mm -hmm. And so I, I espouse that point of view, and yeah, the media is covering it very thoroughly. Can you share a little more about your qualifications for becoming sure. mayor of Minneapolis, your background? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, by profession, I'm an attorney, and I practiced law for uh, two and a half years at a law firm in Minneapolis. And then I had the opportunity to join a plucky little company based in rural Minnesota that maintains other companies' wind turbines. And I joined that company and rose to become the vice president and general counsel of that company. And we expanded uh, to have 120 employees servicing wind turbines across the country and around the world. Now, I'm the first to say the subsidies for wind turbines need to stop now. Uh, that said, my company doesn't build wind turbines. Or, you know, we've sold to a larger company now that has a broader spectrum of, of business lines. Uh, but the standalone company that my colleagues and I built service other people's wind turbines. And you know, just as one example, we work for Excel Energy. And we also work for a lot of the other utilities in the Midwest and across the country. My point is, I've led an enterprise that delivers essential services uh, to really demanding customers. You know, in the wind turbine maintenance business, if I have done a bad job leading the team, my customer can see that fact from five miles away because the wind turbine isn't moving. You know, it, it's stood still there. And City Hall provides services. City Hall provides road paving services and road clearing services, police and fire, school services, regulatory services. So I want to lead City Hall in providing services well, providing them effectively. Uh, and so we sold the company, just to finish out that story there. My colleagues and I sold the company in uh, the fourth quarter of 2012 in a way where all 120 employees kept their jobs and all 120 employees shared in the benefits of the sale. So I still work for our new parent. And to me, it's a story of private enterprise, how private enterprise is the only system that creates widespread, long-lasting prosperity for everyone who wants to participate in that system. And so that's another thing. In addition to delivering the essential services of government, as mayor of Minneapolis, I want to make sure that we are getting our regulatory red tape, our regulatory bottlenecks out of the way of people who want to start and grow businesses in Minneapolis. If I could, I thanks for the time here, but the, the third thing I'd, I'd say is I'm running for mayor. Uh, what enabled me to do the things I've done so far in my legal career, my business career, is the fact that I had a world-class public school education. Now, I wasn't born in Minneapolis. I got here as soon as I could. I was born out east and uh, went to public school from kindergarten through 12th grade. And I'm really grateful to my public school teachers. But you know, I married in Minnesota and ended up here, and as I look around Minneapolis and talk to people around Minneapolis. Every room of people I talk to in Minneapolis, Tony, I say the following. Does anyone here think that the Minneapolis public school system is a world-class engine of opportunity for all of our city's children? Not once has anyone ever said yes. Not once. That status quo is morally wrong. It's morally reprehensible. And as mayor, I've got a megaphone. And as mayor, I want to have direct appointments to the school board so that I can implement policies that put kids first, not teachers' unions, kids. And so, for example, when I'm mayor, I will go to the ends of the earth to get rid of the last in, first out teacher policy, which means that if you're a superintendent and you have to make a budget crunch by letting teachers go, currently under Minnesota law, you must fire the most recently hired teacher, even if she was teacher of the year last year. That's ridiculous. Now imagine a private sector business that had to do that. And who pays the price? It's our children. It's our children who get subpar education. So that's a long answer to a short question, but those are the, some of the things that are uh, my focuses as I run for mayor and, and what's driving me.
And uh, is your wife behind you? Absolutely. Uh, she is. And you know, I want to say this about that because, as I mentioned, it's a nonpartisan race. I'm a small I independent, and I'm building a coalition across the political spectrum. I intentionally chose a DFLer as my treasurer because someone who can't get support from DFLers is DOA in Minneapolis. And I'm in this race to win this race. And so, similarly, my wife's a DFLer, she's a DFL delegate. And that said, uh, we agree on a lot more than we disagree on. You know, the, the, politics is only one small piece of life. And so she is uh, my biggest campaign contributor and an absolute rock of the entire operation. Mm -hmm. And do you have kids? We do. Uh, we have a two and a half year old daughter and a 10 month old son. And my wife's a practicing attorney. So she's juggling a whole lot. And I'm tremendously grateful, always will be, for everything she's doing to enable me to get out there and, and share my message. Have you been able to bring your kids out on the trail yet? I have a little bit. It's fun. Um, I did, though, uh, Tony, I'll tell you, I had my son in one of those carriers on my chest, right? And so I'm walking along at a festival a couple weekends ago, and my son had fallen asleep. And I had someone come up to me and say, oh, is that a, a fake baby? And I thought, is that how far our politics have fallen that people think candidates would walk around with fake babies on their <laughs> chest to solicit votes? I said, no, sir, this is, uh, this is my son. Uh, but yeah, my kids have been out at the parades and festivals, and it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned you, 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 your Minneapolis transplant. That's right. Where were you living before you grew up in? I grew up outside of Philadelphia in a small college town about 15 miles west of Philly called Swarthmore. And uh, then went to college in Philadelphia. And so after 22 years in the same place, I figured it was time to see some more of the world. And so I went overseas. I got a master's degree in London, and that's where I met my now wife. And she was uh, from the western suburbs of Minneapolis. And we lived out east for a while while she finished up college and I finished, I went to law school. And then when it was time for us to put down roots, it was a no-brainer uh, to move back to this area. And we've lived in Minneapolis since 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little more uh, about Mayor Rybeck? Sure. Uh, you know, I, first of all, I want to hear, you know, we like to talk about independent issues and we don't like to bash our opponents too much. Right. I'd like to hear about some of the things that you believe that he's done uh, that's successful Absolutely. as mayor, and then right. maybe point out a couple things that you would improve if you were mayor of Minneapolis. Yeah, sure. So Mayor Rybeck inherited an absolute mess when he became mayor, and I give him a lot of credit for making a bad situation a whole lot better. Objectively, our bond rating has improved. Mayor Rybeck uh, shrank the size of the government workforce, and he put wind in our sails again as a city. He reminded Minneapolis that uh, we're a neat city, as is St. Paul. I'm over on the St. Paul side mm -hmm. uh, now, so I want to be respectful. But you know, he reminded us that Minneapolis is a great place. That said, and while I respect him a lot, and he's been friendly to me in this race, uh, there are some decisions that he's made recently or is poised to make that I do disagree with. The biggest example to me is the streetcar line that I mentioned earlier. Mayor Rybeck believes that the next chapter of Minneapolis history is dependent upon having a streetcar line. And I could not disagree more strongly. Mayor Rybeck wants to put in the streetcar line because he believes that when you put a streetcar line down, real estate development follows the streetcar line. And with, again, with respect, that's simply wrong. I've looked at the data from across the country, and it is true that in cities that have put a streetcar line in, next to the streetcar line emerges development. But you know what? The one is not causing the other. Both things are caused by a third exterior force, specifically handouts, crony capitalism, insider giveaways. And so there are grants, uh, often in the form of tax increment financing, that are used to create a streetcar line. And then the exact same type of handouts are used to create development right next to it. So fast forward five years in a given case, and you have all these mayors from other cities come and say, oh, look at the streetcar line, look at the development next to it. The one must have caused the other. And no, that's simply wrong. Uh, so that's a big one that Mayor Rybeck and I disagree on. And you know, more broadly, under Mayor Rybeck, the quality of the Minneapolis road system has declined. Under Mayor Rybeck, the school system has simply treaded water. And I, I spoke a little bit earlier about the things I would do to put kids first in our schools rather than teachers' unions. Uh, I don't want the teachers' union endorsement. To me, the teachers' union endorsement is a badge of shame because it means that you're willing to put the interests of adults over the interests of kids. And so uh, I disagree with Mayor Ryback on his education policy as well. Hmm.
Is there anything that uh, the the mayor can do um, in terms of property taxes in Minneapolis? Because that seems to be one issue people complain right. about quite often. Or, or is there there much that you couldn't do? Uh, no, there, there's plenty that the next mayor can do, and it really is not rocket science. Not that you were suggesting it was, but spend less money. Spend less money. And so to spend less money, there are two equally important things to look at. The first is the platform that we use as a city for delivering city services. And the second thing to look at is the services that we're purchasing using that platform. So let me hit the second one first, the, the things that we're buying through the platform. Right now, Minneapolis buys a lot of things that it simply does not need. $600,000 is what we'll spend this year on public art. That's 10 cops we could put on the street. That's performance bonuses for our best teachers to incentivize them to keep teaching well, our next generation. Uh, let me give you one example of the $600,000. We're building a $50,000 temporary art installation in front of the Minneapolis Convention Center. So when out of towners come for conventions, they can look at this temporary six week long art installation. It boggles the mind that we're buying that sort of thing. Uh, in addition to the $600,000 a year in public art, we've got a $2 million a year communications department. It's spokespeople who tell the Star Tribune what a great job the city is doing so that in turn we residents can read about what a great job the city is doing. <laughs> to me, in a time of austerity, that's not a good expenditure. So those are some examples of the things we're buying through the system. The big dollars come from changing the service delivery platform. Right now, there's City Hall and next to it is the Hennepin County Government Center. And each of those enterprises has an IT department, each has its own HR department, each has its own finance department, each has its own procurement department. That is silly. What we've seen by merging the Hennepin County library system and the Minneapolis library system is that consolidating back office services works. Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul have done some work to consolidate health departments and that's worked well. And so to go back to Minneapolis City Hall and Hennepin County Government Center, the city of Minneapolis has about 4,500 employees. Hennepin County has about 8,500 employees. And by letting baby boomers retire and simply not filling those slots, attrition, we can respect people's careers, not go in and do massive layoffs, but still save significant dollars by consolidating back office services and letting one office provide the, for example, IT services to both the city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County. And I'll close by saying that, closing this point by saying that, you know, assuming that a given person salary and benefits is about $100,000 a year, uh, for every 10 people who we just let retire, we don't fill that splat, that's a million dollars. Uh, pretty quickly, we start saving real money that we can use to spend on priorities like more police officers and more road paving, and to provide property tax relief to get back to your initial question. Hmm, nice. So uh, before uh, before we go here, I just want to hear a little more about the, the joys of living in, in Minneapolis. Sure. And, you know, some of your favorite restaurants. Oh, absolutely. Some of the great things you like about living there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, folks probably know that at the southwest corner of downtown Minneapolis and then stretching down into south Minneapolis, you have Lake of the Isles, Lake Calhoun, and Lake Harriet. At the northeast corner of Lake Calhoun and the northeast corner, excuse me, northwest corner of Lake Harriet. Just think of the tops of each of those lakes mm -hmm. are fantastic restaurants. Just look for the lines. They're long lines, but they move fast. And one's called Tin Fish, and one's called Bread and Pickle. And at both of those places, you can get a burger and an ice cream cone and a stack of fries and feed the ducks with your kids and watch the sunset and watch the pearl go by. Uh, they're just great experiences. And one other thing, um, a plug for Minneapolis, I found a great thing to go to with out-of-town visitors is St. Anthony Falls, the waterfall in downtown Minneapolis. And a fun fact, the reason Minneapolis exists in the first place is because of that waterfall. It's the only naturally occurring waterfall on the entire run of the Mississippi River. And so when they needed to grind the grain and mill the logs back in the day, uh, they got hydropower from the waterfall. So there's wow. a Minneapolis fun fact. Nice. Well, before we bring on our, our next guest, I just want you to be able to tell the audience a little more about your campaign, how they can sure. help your campaign, your website, Twitter, Facebook, uh, those types of things. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. And, mm -hmm. and first of all, thank you so much again for having me on. It's thank been you. a great opportunity. And uh, my website is wintonformayor.org. You can either put the numeral four or spell out the word, but Winton for Mayor. Dot org, and you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Winton for Mayor and uh, Cam underscore Winton on Twitter. 
And for folks who like to march in parades, knock on doors, make phone calls, uh, I'm welcoming a broad coalition of folks who want to put common sense first and bring a fresh set of eyes to City Hall. Sounds good. Cam Winton, thank Tony, you so much. Uh, Appreciate for it. being on the show. My pleasure. I hope you can come again. Absolutely. Thank you. That was Cam Winton. He's running for mayor of Minneapolis. We thank him for coming on and uh, encourage you to check out his campaign, uh, more of the issues of what he stands for. And, and we're going to be hearing a lot about him, I have a feeling, over these next months. So uh, before we bring on uh, Twin Cities realtor Janice Quinlan, uh, we're going to play a video of a, a boy who had a, a miracle surgery and was able for the first time ever to, to hear for the first time his father's voice. So, uh, Dallas, if you could line up this uh, video. It could be called a modern day miracle. Watch as this little boy hears his father's voice for the first time. Hi, Grayson, talk to him, Daddy. Daddy loves you. Daddy <laughs> loves you. Daddy. Yes, here. Can you hear Daddy? Before this moment, Grayson Clamp had never heard a sound. That's you. <laughs> Grayson. Grayson was born without the auditory nerves that carry sound from the inner ear to the brain. Initially, he was fitted with a cochlear implant, but without nerves, it was ineffective. Bird. Bird. That's when doctors at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine gave him this. It's an auditory brainstem implant. The device is typically used in adults whose nerves have been damaged and hadn't yet been approved for use in children. But that changed thanks to an FDA approved trial. And Grayson became the first child in the country to undergo the procedure. We don't really know exactly what it's like for him. We don't know exactly what he hears, if he hears everything we hear, some of what we hear. Doctors are confident Grayson will eventually hear and speak like any other child. His parents say he's already made great progress, although they won't soon forget what that first moment was like. Time now. Hi, Grayson. Talk to him, Daddy. Daddy loves you. Daddy <laughs> loves you. Daddy. Yes, here. Oh. That, his face, it gets you every time. I mean, you doctors may not, may not like to use the word miracle, but it truly seems like a medical miracle. How does this work? Yeah, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. Dr. Craig Buckman's one of the doctors along with his team. I want to show you because this that's, a, that's quite a beautiful story. And you just like to have these heartwarming stories sometimes at the show, just to, to let people know they're out there who are suffering from various things, whether it's the economy or... Uh, mental anxieties or, or other things that there is hope, you know, and there is hope that things will get better. And, and it sometimes takes little boys or, or little kids to, to show us the true miracles and the true joys in life uh, beyond anything else. So uh, I'm going to bring on our next guest, uh, Ms. Janice Qu Quinlan, and she is a real estate agent here in the Twin Cities. Thank you for being on the show. Hello, Tony. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, great, to, uh, it's great to have you here. And, uh, you know, I'm a loan officer in the mortgage business, so I've been, you know, in the grind and and experience in the real estate market here in the Twin Cities. And so I wanted to have you on just to discuss a little more about the market here in the Twin Cities and, and kind of talk about all these questions that homeowners and prospective homeowners might have about buying a home and uh, what to do with their existing home and investing in real estate. So we're, we're really glad to have you on. Sure, well, thank you. And there is a lot to know, especially this market it has changed so much and it keeps changing and changing rapidly like we've never seen before. Yeah, so can you talk a, a little more first about your experience as a, a realtor? How long have you been a real estate agent for? Okay, I have been in the real estate business for approximately 16 years. And throughout those 16 years, I've seen the up and the down. And the when you start out in a normal real estate market back in the 90s, and then by mid 2000s, um, where prices are skyrocketing, it's out of control. Um, you're writing offer after offer, and people are losing houses because they're being outbidded. Um, it, it's it's stressful. It's very stressful. And then we got to the market where foreclosures were the norm, and people are upside down. And it, it's kind of depressing, and it's really hard to stay even keel with it. 
Mm -hmm. So are you talking to are you talking to some people? Are you seeing the hope starting to increase? And it's coming back. It's coming back. People are the market has improved a little bit, and people are starting to get some of their equity back. And a lot of people have actually saved money. So even if they're upside down, they have a little bit of money stored away, so they can they can sell their house and then they can buy up or buy in a different area, whatever they like. And what's neat is with the interest rates, as you know, they've been super low for quite a while now. They can take advantage of that and their payment is way lower because of that. And it's, it's a fanta fantastic time to buy in real estate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so what kind of uh, decisions you know, people often talk about, should I buy or should I rent? And can you talk about the factors that are involved when, when people are making this type of decision? Sure, sure. Um, in, in the real estate market, if you're looking about buying, you don't know if you should buy or you should sell, um, a good key is, first of all, your income. If, if you're at a job that's pretty, pretty secure, um, if you are paying rent and the rent seems pretty high, then you might think about it, that it could be a good time to buy. Um, if you're in a place in your life where you're really, really um, pretty happy with your location, your job, everything seems to be in place, probably is a good time to buy. Mm -hmm. and, and for the most part, most people who are purchasing, their monthly mortgage with everything involved is cheaper than rent, and you own. So you, you can't really beat that. Mm -hmm. Well, what is, the, what is the average purchase price for a first time home buyer right now in the Twin Cities? Twin Cities is approximately in the middle ones to upper ones for first time home buyer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have your inner city, which can be a little less expensive compared to your suburban areas. But for the most part, it's it's in the one, mid ones to upper ones for first time home buyers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just uh, I see some of these numbers being in the mortgage business. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to rent in, in St. Paul or in the Twin Cities, say a two bedroom house, uh, you're looking at a, a rental payment of somewhere between nine hundred and, and fourteen hundred dollars, I'd Co say, correct. depending on where exactly it yeah. is and the amenities. And if you go ahead and, and purchase a home, uh, say in the, in the range that you said, you purchase a, a house at 150,000, your total payment, your PITI, principal interest, tax insurance payment, is somewhere around that same level, maybe even a lower, you know, right around a thousand dollars. Yes, so. yes. And, and that's a good, good indicator that, well, maybe I should buy and maybe I should, build up that equity in the house as I'm making my payment versus some people think of renting as throwing the money away. Mm -hmm. And we also work with people to find rental property now. And I have a couple of people and they say, well, I want to find this. And I look at the price and what they can get. And I think about if they could buy the difference in that payment. It, it, it's astounding that you're going to pay 1500 a month for this rental. And if you purchase the home payment would be 1500 the quality of life owning versus renting it, it, there's 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 an extreme difference mm -hmm. there so for people out there who who don't know so $150,000 uh, purchase price you know can you describe a little more of what kind of property that would give you sure. how well, many bedrooms square footage and it, it depends on where of course um, depends on single family town home um, single family probably inner city you're looking at 150,000 probably a pretty nice house um, 3 4 5 bedroom home um, usually one to two baths it could be three but that's a little rare at that price suburban 150 you're going to probably i just sold one for a little more than that you're you're going to find a three bedroom home maybe one and a half bath a um, little bit older um, maybe 60s rambler type um, but it's a very affordable payment and they're decent homes right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people, you know, the federal government has initiated quite a few different programs out there to yes. help homeowners and to also um, assist homeowners, first time home buyers in, in buying homes. And one of the programs that, that came out in I think it was 2009 or 2008 was uh, the so-called Obama credit. Yes. You know, where you could buy a home and, and actually get a nice chunk of money as a rebate back in, in your tax returns. Correct. Uh, do, was that program effective in your viewpoint? Yes and no. People took advantage of it. They loved it. 
Um, I've had home buyers just say, great, we get the tax credit. Would they have bought without that? I think so. Uh, unfortunately, I think people took advantage of it, got the money, and they would have bought anyways. So it's just kind of like a, a bonus to get that money. And you had to stay in your house for so long. So those people who did get that credit, which actually helped them as far as if they used it to um, buy down on their equity, um, or build their equity rather, they are now able to sell and not be penalized for that $8,000 first time home buyer. So, you know, they, I'd love to say yes or no to that answer, but it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And then how about what other uh, ho first time home buyer programs are there? I get a lot of calls asking about if there's down payment assistance or, sure. you know, can you talk about what down payment assistance is and, and who it's available to? Sure. Well, the most uh, well-known one is the MHFA, which is a Minnesota-based um, first-time home buyer money, which the buyer then has to go through a class, and it's, it's, not, it's just a one-day class, not a big deal, and they provide you with down payment assistance. Now, there is income level, levels for that, um, so that's, that's really big. There's also, if you didn't want to, or, or maybe you couldn't qualify for that, there's also different programs depending on the county that you live in. There's also rural area monies available. Mm -hmm. And I also am Wisconsin licensed, so I sell some in Wisconsin. And I just had a buyer that used a Wisconsin program um, for down payment assistance. So there are a ton of first-time home buyer money's out mm -hmm. there and with the seller helping you with your closing costs it's very affordable to buy a house if you're a first-time home buyer yeah that's a that's a very important point and, and to clarify i think the rural program is the usda yes. uh, programs yes. and, and as long as the property is located in a usda region uh, you can get financing up to 100 percent of yes. the purchase price yes. meaning that you don't need to have uh, any kind of a down payment, which yes. is great for uh, certain yes. types of buyers out there. It, it is good. I, I have one right now that's a 2% down. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> the same thing happened before where people were 100%, and if the market didn't improve, then they were upside down. But we'll, we'll hope that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to <laughs> see about that. We'll see. Yeah, but uh, so down payments then, uh, different types of down payments for FHA, I think you're looking at 3.5% of the purchase Correct. price. Correct. Uh, for conventional mortgage, you're looking at a minimum of a 5% down payment. Correct. So people, you know, maybe if they want to hear the math, you know, if you buy a $100,000 down payment, you need a $3,500 or $100,000 purchase price you need a $3,500 uh, down payment, and then there's closing costs associated with that. And you mentioned that there's ways that you can draw the contract up so that the sellers pay for the closing costs, is that right? Correct, correct. Um, in, in any mortgage, I should say rules, laws, um, the seller is able to contribute, depending on the program, contribute, and certain programs are up to 6%. So with the FHA, what we're seeing is 3% back, and that's very common where the seller contributes 3%. So the bu buyer, the lender, has to come up with very little. And what we're seeing, especially first-time home buyers, is they might have mo mother and father give them uh, a gift. Mm. And so they're walking in with very little bit down, and, it, and it's, it's a great program for them to get into their house and enjoy um, home ownership. So do, do a lot of people do uh, have a gift as a down payment? A lot of people do. A lot of people, mom and dad who've been in their house for years and years and can afford it, maybe starting to retire and they've got a little nest egg, can put out two, three, four thousand to help their children out, which is phenomenal. And I hope to do that for my kids too. Mm -hmm. Well, you better keep closing some uh, transactions. Exactly, for that. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes. It's getting better. Um, the market is improving. Um, buzz in our office is great. Real estate agents are busy, and it's just such a great energy to be around a real estate office right now. Hmm. And uh, so, in the middle of this week, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, he made a, a you know statement about interest rates and mm -hmm. about the quantitative easing program yes. that's out there. Yes. Essentially, what's been happening uh, for a while now is the uh, Federal Reserve has been buying uh, eighty-five billion dollars worth of, of bonds every single month in an effort to 
keep rates low. And uh, for the first time, or you know, a couple months ago, and then he reiterated it, saying that this program is not going to uh, continue forever. Yes. And uh, so what that did is it sent uh, the 10-year Treasury yield up, which means mortgage rates went up about a quarter to, to three-eighths of a percent just in a matter of a couple of days. For me, it was shocking yes. to see that. Um, do you think that in a higher rate environment, you know, we're, we're used to a, a three and a half to four percent 30 year fixed rate going up now four and a half, maybe even five and a half percent in the near future. Is that going to affect the amount of people who are buying out there? Uh a certain amount, but the affordability is still there. I just think about my first house was 10%. I've talked to people who they bought their first house at 16, 17%. So what you have to do instead of saying, wow, it's up to 5%, so-and-so got theirs at three. Well, that's wonderful. That's great for them. But you just look at 5% and say, okay, what's my house payment? Is, is it affordable? And for the most part, even 4% high threes is phenomenal. Like I said, my first house was 10%. And then when we, we got down to eight, we thought we were living the dream. So it's all relative mm -hmm. and you have to look at your payment and mm -hmm. say, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, most people say, yeah, this is, it's still better than renting. Mm -hmm. so. what, what, what I've found is that when the rates get real low, like they were a couple months ago, yeah. you know, everybody, like, it's almost like a competition. Oh, I got this rate. And, you know, I got this rate and Correct. people become yeah. very rate, rate conscious. And so when they go up a bit, you know, puts things, you know, as you pointed out into, uh, into more of a, a perspective and, you know, just from a finance point of view, you know, if you have a $150,000 mortgage, uh, you know, every eighth of a point increment increases your payment, uh, you know, somewhere between 10 and $20 sure, per sure, month, you sure. know, so, you know, I mean, it's, I don't want to say that that's nothing because $20 is, you know, uh, that can be a dinner or yeah, that could be, sure. uh, you know, half of a cell phone payment or, or something sure. like that. Well, but. and then you also have to look at it as um, you get the people who have already closed, locked on their rates, their low threes, three and a half. And even as it gets higher, they will be four. Well, in a couple years from now, what if it's five, five and a half? those and they want to sell now if a lot of loans are assumable so if if people save their money they can go in there and assume those loans and get that interest rate so there's some going to be some benefit for all those low interest rates and that's what happened back in the 80s people were assuming loans because the interest rates were skyrocketed and we might see that in the future as well mm -hmm. and uh, you know the other thing I wanted to talk about you know, because the economy is getting better, mm -hmm. slowly but surely. The real estate market's slowly getting better. We're finally starting to see home values go up. However, there are still a tremendous amount of people right here in the Twin Cities, White Bear Lake, St. Paul, Stillwater, that are suffering from either they're, they're either backwards on their home. They yes. owe more than what their, their home is worth. Uh, perhaps they have a, a, a nasty second mortgage with a high interest rate that's yes. like a has a vice grip over their yeah. their property in a way. Um, what sort of advice uh, are, are, do you give people who who are in these these types of situations? Well, it, it, it depends on what level they're at. If they're without a job and there's no way they can make any payment and they they just know what do, or what can we do? Um, first of all, you need to talk to your mortgage lender whoever you're with right now, and discuss your is issues. There are ways to modify your loan. So if you are current on your payments and you're making your payments, you can talk to your lender. You can modify your loan, especially if you're currently working and it's affordable. I've, I've dealt with people who have talked to their lender, and especially a second mortgage, they've gotten things reduced. So the lender doesn't necessarily want want the house back. They, they don't want to lose out on that. So what they would love you to do is to talk to them and work that out. And a lot of times um, it's good to call someone like Tony or myself and we can give you advice on that and to see exactly where you are on that scale. If you're out of work or if you're working and it's not quite affordable to you, what direction you should go. Mm -hmm. Of course, they never want you to just walk away from your house, but that's between you and um, your family and what's best, the best decision for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I talk to people that seem to be getting 
bad advice from uh, even attorneys out there. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you have somebody who's got great credit. They've never missed a credit card payment, never missed a mortgage payment. Uh, everything is good on their credit report. And, and then they tell me that, that, you know, that they said that they've gotten advice from attorneys uh, that have told them that what they should do is they should start missing their mortgage payment. Sure. And that would somehow give them more leverage in order to negotiate a modification or uh, something of the sort with their existing lender. And, and I, for one, think that that's uh, not very good advice whatsoever yeah. on, on multiple levels. But have you run into that as well? All the time, actually. Um, the legal thing, the legal uh, hangups on that are incredible. I, I wouldn't even want to touch that. Um, for example, my sister, and about two years ago, she had two brain aneurysms and she almost died. She was off work for a long time. She incurred a lot of debt. And so now they have the government program to refinance. Even if you're upside down, it doesn't matter how far upside down you are, mm -hmm. you can refinance. Because she's way, way under mm -hmm. what, um, or I should say, the, um, her mortgage is way over what the value of her house is. Well, she's tried to refinance, but because her debt to income ratio, she had to go not just less than uh, full time because of her health. She's doing great, but because of her health, she had to go less than um, full time. And so she's tried to refinance and she can't because of that. Now, do I tell my sister, start missing payments, you'll have more leverage. She's got unbelievable credit. I can't do that. She needs to decide what she has to do, what's best for her. Mm -hmm. She loves her house. She doesn't want to move. She wants to stay there. Mm -hmm. So hopefully some other program will come around for someone like her who's had these horrible incidents in their life that, you know, look at your credit. Look, look at the other factors besides just your debt to income. Why is it like that? Um, unfortunately, you don't see a uh, um, the government standards of lending that allow that leeway. Yeah, yeah, so. and I think you know the program that you're talking about is is the HARP, HARP program. program. Yeah, H yeah. A R P. A lot of people have taken advantage of it. There are certain qualifications though that your existing mortgage mm -hmm. has to meet in order uh, to to be able to do the the HARP program. Correct. Uh, a couple of them are you need to have your mortgage originated before May 31st, 2009, mm -hmm. your loan has to be a Freddie Mac or a Fannie Mae uh, loan, yes. meaning that it was bought by uh, these big uh, companies. Yes. And uh, so a lot of people don't, don't, don't fall into that, that category. But uh, what HARP did, though, is it, it essentially underwrites the loan the same way as, as a normal uh, conventional loan would be underwritten. The one, the one exception is, is you don't need an appraisal. Yes. On the property. Yes, because you could be way upside down on your property, which is wonderful to help people to get to refinance. But like I said, sometimes, unfortunately, even if you have great credit and you're current, mm -hmm. if you've got debt to income issues, then, yep. then you're, it's not going to work. Yep, things change. You need to have the, the income and you need to have the mm -hmm. employment history and everything. And, you know, one, one area that I, I want to begin lobbying for, though, is for HARP 3.0. Because you know, like you mentioned, your sister and there's other people who aren't able to benefit from the from the heart program. Sure. Is is the next heart has to deal with people who had some of these exotic mortgages mm -hmm. uh, that they got into that aren't Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and also people who have these exotic second mortgages on their property. For instance, if you have a balloon on your on your mortgage, you're not going to qualify for HARP. Those people need help. Yes, they do. They absolutely need and, help. And, and the underemployed, because the economy took such a hit, all the people, even if they, they might have been unemployed, and then they went back into the workforce, but then were underemployed and are not making as much money as they were once making, and now they don't qualify because of that. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, and you're right, uh, HARP 3.0 would be great. Yeah, and I, I think we need to talk to our uh, Minnesota delegation here. People need to talk to Congresswoman Betty McCollum and Senator Klobuchar and Senator Franken and, and uh, Representative Klein, the whole works. Call them up and ask them uh, for HARP 3.0 to help people who don't have the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgages that are underwater I, I believe that the people should be demanding this, and, and hopefully, maybe it'll be a, a campaign issue in, in 2014. That would be great. That Definitely. would be awesome.
So uh, switching topics a little bit here, um, do you? Uh, I want to talk about investing in real estate. Okay. Because you know there's various uh, real estate investments. You have your owner occupied home, your primary residence. Yes. Uh, you can buy uh, second homes, like vacation mm -hmm. homes or, or lakefront properties mm -hmm. in Minnesota. That's got to be that's a huge market right there. Yes. And then there's also uh, the non-owner occupied investment property where you're buying either a single family residence and, and renting it out or duplex or triplex or fourplex. Yes. Do you work with those properties and those investors? I sure do. I sure do. Um, I have sold cabins, lake homes. I've worked with investors that are especially the ones that have been foreclosures and are um, relatively inexpensive, but they know they have to go in and put some money into it and then either turn around and flip it as a more expensive home, very nice because they fixed it up, or they decide to keep it and rent it. And there is a rental market out there for people who, because they have foreclosed or short sale in the past, cannot um, purchase right now so they need to rent so the the market is huge there so we're seeing that more than we ever have mm -hmm. or they might want to sell and they're okay with selling it on a contract for deed there's a lot of I've, I've never dealt with so many people in my life who want to buy a contract for deed because their credit isn't great and they need three, four, five, six years to get their credit back in line and they're able to um, buy on a contract. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point that you bring up. Can you explain a little more what a contract for deed is? Because they're, they're a little confusing. I don't think everybody quite understands what, what they are in the option. Sure, sure. What you're doing is you're purchasing a home um, that instead of um, getting the mortgage yourself, the seller is actually holding on to your mortgage. Typically, they do want anywhere from 10 to 20 percent down so usually you'll have to have cash so you have that amount of money and you decide on the terms with the seller being in a three-year balloon which means you in three years have got to refinance and get a mortgage or a lot of them we're seeing is five to six year balloons so then you make the payment to the seller and that goes towards your equity so you're not losing out but the major downfall is the fact that you have to put that lump sum at the beginning. And some people do have that. They've, they've saved the money. They just don't have the credit. So that's a very viable option for a lot of people right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the investment properties, for people that want to uh, buy, invest, what, are, what are the characteristics like of these investors? Are they just people who have jobs and, and have extra cash to spare? or It's all across the board. I've run across investors. That's all they do. They take care, they, take, they go into the houses, fix them up, that's how they make their money. Um, we have a gentleman in our office who used to be our vice president and decided, you know what, I want to get into working. So he buys these homes and, and he, he has great credit, so of course he has a credit line at the bank, so he's able to pay cash on these homes. He spends so many weeks fixing it up and turns around and sells it. Very few times does he actually rent it but you do find a number of those people who are doing that, that are renting the properties. So there, there are also people who have full-time jobs, who work out of, in their other job and they dabble in real estate. And so what they do is they go to um, these homes, they hire people to take care of it, and in the end they make some money on it. And it's a win-win for everybody because mm -hmm. they take these distressed properties and fix them up. And all that does is improve everybody else's value in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful. wonderful and uh, do you think it's a, an option? We were talking about people who maybe are stuck in their home because they have the they have they're underwater. Uh, is it an option for these people to perhaps uh, rent out their existing place and then move somewhere else or even buy somewhere else? Well, it, it as far as to to start out first time or for the first thing is to purchase even though you rent you'd have to qualify for both and you do have to have a one-year lease in place before you can use that as income so to just start renting and want to buy you have to be able to qualify for both unless it's the one-year seasoning okay so that is an option for people and usually they can get enough rent to 
pay for their mortgage, or be pr relatively close. So that's a really good idea for people who are upside down. I see that a lot too. Um, unfortunately, you also see the people who rent their homes and uh, are um, not making the payments anymore and then collecting the money. And that's that's reality right now in our market that people are doing that. Too. Wow. Yeah, yeah, well, I see it every day. And I've actually shown um, foreclosed homes that have, um, are on the market, you go to show them and there's renters in there because they had a lease with the sellers, or not the sellers, but the homeowners as they're foreclosing and the bank, because of uh, laws, has got to let them go through their lease. So you're showing foreclosed homes that have renters in them. And there's, are they still paying on the lease or? They pay the bank. Oh, they pay the yeah, bank. Yeah, then they have to pay the bank. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, but it does happen right now. Mm. And then how would you find out more about how much can I rent my house for? Is that something that people would call you about? Yes, or? yes. They, they can call me, and my number will be shown, and call me, and uh, I'll discuss your options. Nice. And do you work with uh, short sales at all? All the time, yep, yep. And that's just it. You, ha you have to be full-time in this business to understand all the different bank mediated properties. Um, you have the short sales, which when people are upside down, um, and I interview people just to see if they're a good fit for a short sales. Sometimes if you're making pretty good money, the bank won't accept a short sale. They just say, no, you, you can make the payment. But if you have some family issues, especially like divorce, we've seen a lot of short sales with people getting divorced and one or the other can't afford it. So. Um, so yes, I work with a lot of short sales, buyers and sellers. And buyers too, short sales can be a fabulous deal for buyers. Um, on the whole uh, scale of um, types of real estate, you have short sales being the least expensive, then you have foreclosures being just a little higher, and then you have retail, which the people who have the equity in the property. Now the short sales are the less expensive. You'll get the best deal on a short sale, but you have to have patience because it can be anywhere from two to six months. I've even Ooh. seen longer than that Ooh. because the bank takes forever. And uh, if you ever wanna see something that makes no sense whatsoever, no common sense, deal with the bank because that's, that's what we're dealing with right now. And you have to know your way around all their, uh, all their paperwork. Yeah, and of course, every lender's different and they have different processing everyone, centers. And everyone is different. So, so if you're considering a, a, a short sale, then you, you need to have an immense amount of patience and you probably shouldn't have an urgent need to have to move somewhere very fast. Correct, correct. You gotta be in there for the long haul and you know that you're going to get a good deal in the end. Mm -hmm. so. And then what's the average, You know, just for your, your regular traditional purchase, what's the average contract time right now in the Twin Cities? Right now, it's about 45 days. Um, if you are doing a conventional loan, you can get it done within 30, but FHA, you really need 45 days, and you, you might might push that up to um, two months, mm -hmm. 60 days. And you have, uh, you know, when your buyers come to you, do you try to encourage them to go conventional versus FHA? Is there a difference in terms of when you're negotiating with the seller, are they gonna look at, is this person FHA qualified or well, conventional? Um, I leave that to the mortgage person. Um, I, my philosophy is I'm an expert in real estate and the mortgage person is an expert in, in the mortgage industry. But with that said, I also explain to them the benefits of conventional versus FHA. FHA and VA loans are pretty common in their appraisal part of it where with the appraisal, the lender hires an appraiser, goes out and not only gives it the value, but also calls the work orders, which right now for FHA, VA, you're looking at things like uh, peeling paint, um, roofs, furnaces, um, handrails, things like that for safety issues. Um, they don't want you to move into a house and all of a sudden a year later you're foreclosing because you can't afford the broken down furnace. Yeah, Janice Quinlan, thanks for uh, coming on the show. And quickly, can you let people know how they can get a hold of you? Sure. Um, uh, Janice Quinlan, CB Burnett, or J Quinlan, CB Burnett.com or 651 285 6509.
And uh, that's coming. We're coming to the top of the hour here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on SCC Television Studios. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios.